The question that has evaded us all for centuries, and now I'm going to solve it in 25 minutes. Does God exist? Evidence. Right, okay, before I start, we're going to have a little, um, what do you call it? It's a rhetorical question, is it, when you don't shout out the answer. That's right. English teachers among us. Have we got anybody? Right, okay. So, think in your mind, are you an, uh, an atheist? And if you're watching at home or whatever, just think this through. So an atheist is someone that doesn't believe in God. Are you an agnostic? You're not sure. Think about it in your mind. Wherever you're listening to this, if you're listening to this at home, whatever, are you an atheist? You're not believing God. Are you an agnostic? You're not sure. Or are you a theist? You do believe in a God. In God. Think that through in your mind. So you've, you hopefully have reached one of three. You can only be one of those three. Okay. You're either there by accident or design or chance. Some people literally don't give it a second thought until the day they die. But you're there. You've, you've worked it out. Now, of that, of, that, of that, whatever you think you are, if 100% means that you are basically, for you, it's all faith. And one, I should do the way around. So 100% means it's all science. That's all you care about, facts, proof. So that would be 100 that's why you believe what you believe. And let's say zero would be faith. So somewhere you were on that, logically, <laughs> you must be somewhere in that sphere. Either you are all about facts. So the reason you are a whatever, a theist, an agnostic, or an atheist, is because you believe that factually, 100%, you don't care about faith, this is what you believe. Or you are, 100, you are zero, if you like, the other, the other pendulum, where he says, I only care about faith, I do not care about facts. Now, it's unlikely you're any one of those extremes. But think about where you would be on that pendulum. Obviously, don't shout it out, just think it through. My guess, for most of us, that's possibly one of the first times you've ever actually done that. Most of us go through life, and actually, I don't mean to insult anybody here, talking to myself, I drift through life waiting to die, <laughs> basically. I don't think about the big things. And I'm a Christian. I've been brought up in church. I've been brought up to think about the big things. But I think one of the biggest lies that Satan has on, on the world is not to think about the big things. Yeah. To be born, drift through life, and then die. And never really think, well, is there a God? D do they exist? And that's a big question, you see. It's hard. It's a hard question to answer. It's an impossible question to answer in 25 minutes, let me tell you. It is a hard question to answer. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explore that thought today with us. And I want you to bring that, leave that in your mind. And if nothing else, every now and again think, what am I and why am I what I am? Genesis 1, the beginning in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening and there was morning the first day. These glasses, by the way, they, they react to light. So they, they've not gone dark. I don't look like I've like got dark glasses on, do I? They look normal. Okay, that's good. I don't look like, so stand up like, like, like you've got some guy with your sunglasses on making a statement. There ain't no statement here. I just can't see. So this, in truth, this has not been an easy sermon to write, actually, because what are my credentials? I'm not a scientist. I'm not a fool. I'm a, I'm a qualified guy, but I'm not a scientist. I'm not a physician, I'm not a professor of cosmology or anything like that. <clears throat> I'm not a biochemist, I'm not a doctor. How scientific then do I go with second-hand facts? How, when I look, I mean, there's a, a plethora of information on this. Over these last few weeks, when I've been working on this message, I have, I've, you know, I've had things on YouTube on while I've been working and what have you. I've, I've listened to stuff, I've read stuff. There is a lot to go at. And also, how scientific I go, do I go from your point of view? With all respect to this lovely, intelligent-looking people out here, I don't think there's that many scientists here either. 
So there's no point me speaking like a biochemist who isn't a biochemist to another biochemist who isn't a biochemist. There's, there's literally no point in doing that. Instead, what I've done is I've taken 25 minutes to explore the topic of evidence from nature and science that proves the Bible, but, all, but primarily by expanding our thinking, giving us some, some tools to dig a bit deeper, and encouraging all of us to intellectually connect with this most important of questions, which is, is there a God? What happens when I die? What do I need to do with the rest of my life? Because you see, whether we call ourselves Christians or not, whatever we called ourselves, and maybe we did that little, little exercise earlier on, we have a belief system. It takes faith to be an atheist or a Christian. Yeah. See, you've read this before. You've been here. <laughs> it does take faith to be an atheist. It does take faith to be a Christian. But both of those... Both of those have evidence involved. And we mustn't, we mustn't disengage our intellect. Science is around us. And science, I believe, helps to prove deity. It helps to prove God. It helps to prove Jesus all over the place. In fact, when we first started this, this, the thinking about the next season, what happened was I was uh, walking through a field one day, and um, then I walked through the same field the following day or the day after, and when I'd walked through the, the previous day, it was green, really bright green field. And I walked through the two, three days later. It might have only been the second day after. And it was bright yellow, like yellower than Padmore's shirt. It was bright yellow. And, and it's because almost overnight, something had happened. Something had happened in creation that took this field of, of whatever it was into something that now was different. Something, it is rapeseed actually, yeah. And uh, it, it, something had happened, and it was, I, was, I was mesmerized by it. And I'm like, well, man, this is crazy. Yesterday I walked down here, and this was all green. And today I've walked down here, and it's all yellow. I, I was blown away by it. Now, I'm not saying that just because I've seen a field change color, that proves God exists. But, but more and more, I started then to think about the design of our world. About living in, his, in, a, in a world built by a designer, not by chance. The interesting thing about science, you see, is that they talk a lot about proof. But a lot of the, the things that we think are proven are not proven at all. That's not a knock at that. But interestingly, I mean, I'm going to quote a few people here. Brian, Professor Brian Cox, Richard Dawkins, John Lennox. So these are three names that maybe some of you haven't heard of. But these are atheists and Christians and agnostics all rolled into one. Richard Dawkins is a very famous atheist, very outspoken. He says about science, these words, science uses evidence to discover the truth about the universe. It's been getting better at it. Now, I'm not suggesting that science is wrong. I'm not. But what I'm saying is we must be aware of what we are pinning our understanding on. John Lennox, Professor John Lennox, a Christian, he said this, encourage us all to be intellectually inquisitive, not despite being a Christian, but because we are Christians. And you know what? I, I do think that as Christians, we're not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily come out all the time. I'm not suggesting that as, as, as Christians or as Christian leaders, we're encouraging people to disengage their intellect. But we, we do emphasize faith, and, and rightly so. But we have got an intellect, we have got an understanding, and we, we're wrong to pretend it doesn't exist. Let's just talk a little bit about proof, just to understand what that word proof means. Many things provide strong evidence for theories, of course they do. But in reality, proving anything is almost impossible. I mean, proving, 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 proving. Because reality is a very complicated place. And most things are built somewhere down the line on a level of assumption. Many things are also are described in, in phrases that are chances. Like the, we, we use words like trillions to one. But then we accept that as proof. I'll come back to what a trillion is in a minute. Of course, there are some ways we can prove things, isn't there? We can, we can, we've got a cause and effect so if you put a heat under water, it will always boil at 100 degrees, won't it? Well, no, it won't. 
No, water doesn't always boil at 100 degrees. If, if it's been contaminated in some way or if it's in the engine of your car, it, it won't boil at all because it's, it's not got oxygen there. So many of the things that we take as proof, as fact, we do need to accept that there just might be a different way of looking at things. Now, I'm not suggesting that, you know, when a child goes through that, yeah, but why phase, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, but why? I'm not suggesting that as adults we go through our whole lives saying, yeah, but why? Yeah, but why? Yeah, but why? But I'm suggesting that every now and again it's important that we sit down and take a little step back and say, yes, but why? And I'd say this not to discredit evidence or proof. It's very important that we don't do that. But I'm saying that to open our eyes and to encourage us to seek truth for ourselves. And I think where I've come from in this is ultimately I, I am responsible for I'm responsible for other people. Of course I am. For Rachel and other people, members of my family and what have you, responsible for you lot. But I'm also responsible for Terence Clark. Am I satisfied to my satisfaction that I have done my diligence? So that water in boiling experiment, in the context of my understanding, if I heat water, it boils. I'm comfortable with that as a scientific explanation. I know it's not 100% true, but I know it's, I'm comfortable with it as an explanation. I also consider reliable witnesses. If certain people tell me something is a fact, in their field, I believe them 100%, I would stake my life on it. If that certain person told me something else was a fact that isn't their field, like I was talking earlier on about me being a biochemist, well, I'm, you would know that I'd be being sincere, but it doesn't, I'd be copying someone else's words because I'm not a biochemist. So reliable witnesses are important. We can look at them and we can learn from them, but we need to realize what we're looking at. Time and observation. If we tell someone we love them, at what point does it become true? So when I tell you that I love you, when is that true? At the moment that I tell you, or is it proven in truth? In five years, in ten years, in twenty years. So by time and observation, by observing the way that I live my life with someone that I claim to love, then you can draw an assumption gradually that I probably do love that person. Even though you're not in the relationship, you would probably say that. But that takes time and observation. But these are all ways that as individuals we can consider the world and work stuff out. When we're talking about this proof thing, you know, they do talk about things, well, that's a trillion to one, but we think that's what happened. A million to one is 11 days in seconds. A billion to one is 32 years in seconds. A trillion to one is 32,000 years in seconds. So when we're talking about chances that are trillions to one, we are talking about the chance of things happening that is 32,000 years in seconds to one. You have more chance of winning the lottery every day of the rest of this year. So we need to understand what we believe in him. Then we look at people, like I said about reliable witnesses. I've got a, a friend who's an atheist. I, I don't think he's really thought that through. I'm not trying to insult him. I don't think he has. But he would say words like, well, you know, intelligent people have proven, scientists have proven. Professor Brian Cox, the guy I mentioned earlier on, I've read a lot of his stuff recently. I like him. You know, he's a genuine 80s pop star professor, you know, you know, of cosmology, for goodness sake. So I like him. And just when things couldn't get any better, he said this. I don't personally have a faith in God. I don't have a religion I adhere to, but I am not an atheist. All I have to admit is I don't know. The worst thing we could say is you cannot be a scientist and believe in God or a Christian. I genuinely think that science does not rule out the existence of a creator. So he's a wise man. He's not said in his heart there is no God. He said, I can't work it out. He's working on his, on his journey. The Nobel Prize Prize is not a single prize. It's five prizes. But over the last hundred years, these people that would generally be considered the most educated, the most creative, the brightest, the most industrious, the most free-thinking among us. 65% of them are Christians. The brightest buttons in the world. 31% of the world, broadly speaking, say they're Christians. 65% of the most intelligent people in the world every year would claim to be Christians. So we are not on our own. And when my friend, the atheist, says, well, science is proven, it's because he's not looked at the facts. Science hasn't disproven it at all. And, and influential, educated scientists do not say there is no God. 
Many of them say, I don't know, or many of them say, there is a God. Sometimes, some people have got a louder voice, particularly nowadays, and they, they impact our mind. So you get guys like celebrities like Ricky, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Fry, outspoken atheists. Man, they get angry about God, particularly Stephen Fry. Look him up on YouTube, he really hates God. I'm not misquoting him, that's what he says. I don't understand that. Boom, exactly. You know, if I don't believe something, if I don't believe something, I don't get angry at it because I don't believe it. It's ridiculous. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not angry about something that's a fairy tale because it's a fairy tale. I might get angry. I mean, I could understand if you got angry with Christians. That I can understand. But he doesn't. He's angry at God. There's something else going on there that's not about his atheism. So we need to be aware the mirror we're looking through, the people we're looking at, how we're being influenced by society. All these things subconsciously impact on us. People influence us in ways that we don't always know. Then from that we can decide our own position on the matter and look, is there a designer? Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. For these next 10, 15 minutes, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to point to a designer and a creator and encourage all of us and anybody watching to look for the designer and the creator. For me, the world is... It doesn't whisper there is a creator. It shouts out there is a creator. And this is what's created some of the challenges to some scientists, not all of them, like I've said, but to some scientists who cannot accept the existence of a God, then they have to look for other solutions, no matter how implausible they may be, in order to fulfill those questions that we've all got. See, the appearance of Earth is not just unlikely. It's with all its immense variation and interdependence and times and seasons and complexities. It's statistically, scientifically impossible. That's what Earth is. The emergence of intelligent life isn't, is so crazily difficult to expect. These are words from people like, Joe, like Brian Cox, not my words. That all the factors need to occur in just the right order for the, for the, for the universe to give us what we have. Brian Cox on his, on his recent TV programs that I've watched, um, they're, they're out now, look them up. They're on whatever it were, Sky or whatever, but look at them. They call someone like this wonderful world or something. Anyway, he, he, he gets blown away by science. I love him, he's so enthusiastic. And he's looking for alien life. And when we say alien life, you know, we immediately think of E.T. Or we think of, you know, um, uh, Klingons or whatever it might be that has got like a level of sort of intelligence about it. He's looking for a bacteria. He's looking for an amoeba. He's looking for anything, anything at all, single cell organism. He says, and they've not found anything yet in our solar system, which is, our solar system is enormous. And he says, he doesn't, he can't imagine, he says, he'd love to find it some type of life. He cannot imagine ever finding intelligent life. And suddenly that's what we are. <laughs> well, you lot are anyway, I might not be. The, odds, the argument goes on. The odds of us coming to be are so infinitesimally small, it's unreasonable to believe that it could happen by chance. Let's take Earth, Earth's position. We're 93, we're 93 million miles from the sun. Any closer, we'd burn up. Any further away, we'd freeze. Life can grow and reproduce, basically down to about minus 15 degrees C and up to about 122 degrees C. We can live for a short while in those conditions, but we can't really live there. The earth has those conditions, the Death Valley and places like that, the Arctic. But where people live, we have this unique infrastructure, an ecosystem that allows rapeseed to grow the day after it looked like grass. Then you've got to have the correct building blocks, haven't you? You've got to have things like water. Water, the most basic of existence. Water in this plastic bottle that will outlive us all. Water. Without water to survive, we die. That's a fact. Now, that is a fact. 
Within our solar system, there's only one planet known to have water at the scale needed to support life. By chance, we happen to live on that planet. It's the only planet. Now, there are planets which with, with, with may have water. We're not completely sure yet. But they do not have it in the right quantities to support life. We've got ice. We've got water. We've got vapor. We've got continents. We've got islands. We've got seas. We are rich in elements like this. As a, as a, as a world, we are incredibly wealthy. Of course, on top of that, we've got small things like oxygen, atmosphere, gravity, time, all these things that make life possible. And all this on our little world. Then you look at the evidence of biology and complexity. You know, DNA, I'm going to try and say this word, deoxyribonic nucleic acid. I didn't get that right, but you know, there we go. I didn't say I'm not a biochemist. Um, this is a long molecule that contains our unique genetic code. It's in animals, it's in plants, it's in single cell organisms, it's in bacteria, it's in every cell of my body. And it tells my body what proteins to make. It's a material that tells all living things how we function. There's six feet of DNA coiled up inside every one of us. That's a hundred trillion cells, a hundred trillion, a hundred trillion, 32,000 seconds of cells in every one of us. Each contain a four-letter chemical alphabet that spells out the correct, precise assembly instructions. And me and my brother have different DNA. We've got similarities, but we've got different DNA. This family will have different DNA. Now, there's similarities, don't get me wrong, but we all have different DNA. It's immensely complicated. Put it another way, it's over 3 billion letters long. That's over 93 years in seconds long. If the DNA in the human body was unraveled, it will travel the 93 million miles to the sun and back 300 times in one human body. This is how complex we are. We mustn't play down what amazing creatures we are. What incredibly wonderful creations we are because that's what we are no hypothesis has come close to explaining this nothing comes close it's oh and then this dna nothing comes close to explain how this immense and complicated information got into biological matter by by natural means there is no explanation for it Then we've got the evidence of consciousness. We are human beings. And the law of chemistry and physics does not explain consciousness. Things like introspection, sensation, thoughts, emotions, desires, beliefs, free choices. These what make us alive and aware of our, of our environments, of who we are. Our soul contains our consciousness and animates our bodies. Now, some of you will have animals out there. I've got two cats. They're annoying. And sometimes it seems like they're intelligent. Sometimes it seems they're as thick as a brick. I really, I really don't know. But you will, hear, you, will, you will hear people talk about their animals like they're intelligent or they're educated. They're not. Now, they're not like human beings. They are not self-aware. They do not have this level of detail. They, are not, they do not have a soul. They do not, they're, not, they're not created in that way. They're wonderful things, don't get me wrong, but they're not human beings. They do not have consciousness. And to think that came from nothing, from a single cell that multiplied itself, which is an event that was itself trillions to one, and then it happened again, and that again was also trillions to one, and then it happened again. Over a series of chances, we ended up with a conscious, self-aware, living, thinking, feeling, believing creature. Much, much better to think we imitate our maker. It's much, much, much better to think, you know what, we've got a creator out there and I'm a bit like him. Instead of being an unrepeatable and unbelievable chance, we are instead a created, thought out, worked out creation of God. Starting from the mind of God. I'd much rather believe in that. And each one of us is. 
Now, that's not me, just me. And we're not globally taken on board like that. God knows all our names. Each one of us is a small part of the creator. Each one of us imitate the maker. The band want to wanna come up. I'm just going to sort of conclude with a few final thoughts. Like I said at the beginning, all of us, whether you like it or not, we make a decision. Do we believe in God, in, in God, in God or not? Are we an atheist? Are we an agnostic? Are we a theist? We have that decision to make with our lives. Whether we make it out by accident or by design or by default or by chance, whatever, there will come a point in our lives, maybe when we pass away, when that decision will be final. And the decision will be made. The best way to do that is to undergo a thoughtful consideration of the facts, of knowledge, of experience, of faith, of reliable witnesses, to actually take the time to consider what is going to happen to me, to actually consider these real-life questions. I absolutely believe Christianity stands up to scrutiny, and I did not want to stand up here and reel off a dry load of facts here this morning. I couldn't quite see the value of that. So what I want to do instead is to open your minds to look at the facts. Faith is great, and we all need faith. But don't be scared to look at the facts. Yes, it's a journey of faith, but so is atheism. So is whatever you're involved in. Trust me, it is. It really is. When I end... To repeat the words of Professor Lennox who says this, I want to encourage us all, whether we are Christians or non-Christians, just because you're a Christian does not mean you stop looking and stop understanding. I'm going to encourage you to be intellectually inquisitive, not despite being a Christian, but because you are a Christian.